So yes, it does show up. There we are, live on YouTube. Now all I have to do is switch the recording on here too. Welcome, Natasha. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm just going to let you launch straight in. Thank you so much for inviting me in. I was um, thrilled to be asked and knowing that this is going out to uh, young people, uh, I, was, I was reflecting on what would I have loved to have known uh, when I was growing up. Because I remember clearly being, you know, in like 9, 10, 12, 14, at this tender age where I was thinking, like I think a lot of us do, do, um, who am I? Why am I here? What's it all about? And I, of course, I didn't have anybody to ask those questions because nobody knew. So I started searching in books and I uh, looked everywhere to find out who am I really? And now, all these years later, one of the things that, I've, that I know is that who I am has never left me. That there's a knowing that we all have that is always there. I remember realizing actually at an early age that it was, I felt like it can sound a bit corny, but what's looking out of my eyes? There was something inside of me that felt like it didn't age. I could certainly see myself aging, especially now that I have little white hairs coming out. But, but at the time, I was noticing that there was something in me that just didn't seem to age. There was something that I knew was me. And I think that's something that actually everybody, if they just search inside, if they for a moment just put attention to the inside of who we are, can get a sense, oh, there's something that's me. We usually call it I. Like even beyond whatever name we've been given from birth, there's a sense of I. We say, I am hungry, I'm tired, or I'm confused. Well, who is the I that I'm talking about? Who is the I that, that is asking these questions? So my search for knowing who I am went through the path of knowledge. I thought that if I read enough books, if I went to enough seminars, I would know who I was. And it's so funny now to look back and, and see that the knowing of who I, who I am has always been there. In fact, it's all that's ever been there. Knowledge comes in books. You'll read books when you're young, you read other books when you're old, I still think. But I don't to find I, th I think your internet has gone a little there now, unless that's mine. Okay. But I didn't hear the last, the last few things that you said. It went a bit... Ew. I said something like, all we know is knowing. Like if you, for instance, say, well, um, how are you? You have to kind of go inside and check. How am I? Well, I'm, I'm okay today or well, I have a little of a stomach ache or whatever it is. There's a knowing that knows how you're doing. This knowing doesn't come and go. It's the only thing that doesn't come and go. Now, whether or not I'm hungry or not, that will come and go. As soon as I eat, I'm not hungry anymore. Whatever I think comes and go, goes. Whatever I feel comes and goes. And as a young person, I remember believing so much in what I felt. Well, if I felt it, it must be true. Not really noticing that my feelings were changing constantly. What I thought was true changed constantly. Which rock star I was thought was amazing changed. Who I, who I wanted to be friends with changed. So there was a shift that happened once I understood that there is something that's constant in our life that ne never comes and goes, it's just always there. And that's knowing. So I decided to call this, this talk today, the power of knowing, because there's a power in being grounded in what is known. If I, if I try and be grounded in what I believe to be true in the moment, then it's constantly shifting and there's no grounding. If you're standing on something and it keeps shifting, you're gonna feel insecure. And so a lot of people, and, and me as a young person, felt extremely insecure 
because the ground that I was standing on was every belief that I had. It was the belief that what I think is true, what I feel is true. This friend is now saying this about me. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. So, so all the things that were shifting were the things that I believed to be true. I didn't know any better. And I do now. So there's, there's this thing that I really wanted to get across to people, which is that there is a knowing that is beyond what, we, what our intellect tells us to be true. There's a knowing that's beyond whatever feeling that I have, whatever thought I have, whatever, whatever I believe to be true. I have um, my um, niece who is 14 years old. It's so interesting watching her these years, how she, uh, one rock star will be the, like Justin Bieber. Oh my gosh, I'll love him forever. And then, you know, six months later or a year later, it's, it's someone new. And I remember that uh, being young and believing that that, that was, would be true, that this person I'll love forever or that will happen or I will become whatever it is that, that I believe that I would become at that tender age. So I want to come back to knowing what, what is it and, and how is it important to us? What, what does it mean to shift from the grounding that comes from beliefs that, that is always unstable to actually be grounded in knowing? Now, Sid was, uh, when he talked about it in some of his video, you'll hear him say there is knowing and there's knowing. <laughs> And, and I, I enjoyed how he spoke about that. So this, so I'm speaking about the deeper knowing. For instance, how do you know that you love someone? How do you know that? Is it because there's a list? Right? If, I, if, I, if somebody asked me, why do you love your husband? I couldn't make a list. Well, I could, but that's not it. Well, how do I know what I want to do with my life? A list? No. I could have been a doctor or a nurse or a rock star or a physicist or I, I could have been, uh, you know, any number of things. But there came a time in my life where I just knew that sharing was what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach. I wanted to share something. Now, this was, this was obvious to me actually from an early age. When I was 16, I started teaching table tennis because I was involved with table tennis at the time, or ping pong, as you call it somewhere. Then at 19, I became a Tai Chi instructor, and I started teaching Tai Chi. At 20, I was interested in meditation, and I started to teach meditation. At 25, I was finished as a psychotherapist, and I started sharing what I knew about how the mind works, at least how I thought the mind worked at the time, which I've later in life found out was, was only partially true. There's much deeper truth that I love sharing now. So from, from an early age, sharing with other people has just been, I just know that this is my path. And that's something that I would have loved to have known from an early age. There's so much pressure on young people to know what they want to do. Well, what do you want to be when you get, get older? How are you going to know? I know very few young people who actually are in touch with this knowing. I know some who, who are. I met uh, somebody recently at 14. He said, I want to become an accountant. Wonderful. Um, that's great. I'm sure he will be and probably be good at it. It doesn't matter what it is. But to know that there comes a time when I just trust that life unfolds beautifully when I get out of the way. So when I say when I get out of the way, what I mean is my little self, the little self who thinks that it knows everything, the little self that is the, uh, we call it sometimes the ego or, or just little self. There's this, oh, I want to be a rock star. I want to be a, um, somebody who blogs. I want to be a blogger. Uh, I want to be a famous uh, chef. Like there's a, there's a little me that can think that it wants to be famous and rich and be on YouTube all the time. That's not the knowing that I'm talking about. When we let go of the little me who wants to know, who needs to know, who, because we all want to stand on solid ground. It, it's, 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 it's only natural for us that we want to stand on something that's natural, that's grounded, that's stable. 
So we, we try and search for something out there that seems stable, it seems to be true. But to know that there's something inside that will let us know exactly what it will be right for us, depending on who we are and, 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 and what is our, our way of expressing ourselves, something will, something will turn up inside a knowing. We sometimes call this wisdom. We all have this wisdom, all of us. So, so when I work with young people today, often I'll have them in the age of between 16 and, and 20, I'll have young people come to me and ask me, well, there's all this pressure. How do I know which way to go? Where, you know, what should I study? Should I go to university? Should I take a year or two off and go traveling? And what I, what I, all I do is I help them to point them back to the knowing inside of them that is as fully functional at 10, 15, 20 as it is when it's 50 or 60 or 70. It's the same knowing. We all have it. It never goes anywhere. In fact, it's the only thing we can trust. It's our grounding. The more we can relax into and notice that this is actually what's been guiding us all our lives, and the more we can trust that it will continue to do so, the more we can relax into life as it is and let it unfold the way that is absolutely perfect for us. Not necessarily the way my little me thinks that it should be, because that certainly has not been true um, for a lot of my life. But there's been a deeper knowing. So I started teaching when I was 16, as I said, um, and started sharing uh, this, this knowledge about what we call the three principles about seven years ago. I just know that I'll be doing this forever. I'm sure I'll change my words, I'll change the ways that I share it, but there's a knowing inside that is the same. And sharing from what I know is very different than sharing my knowledge. I know tons of things. I've read a lot of books, thousands. I've gone to many seminars. But the best teacher I've ever had is right in here. It's inside. There's nothing on the outside that can let you know what you need to know. There's a knowing inside that's your best guide. Sure, it can be helpful to go to somebody who shares um, the three principles or you know, other guides who can help you get in touch with your own knowing, but that's essentially all that we can ever do. We can't put knowledge into you. Well, we can, but that's not going to be helpful. Your best teacher, your only teacher is wisdom. The knowing that is already inside, it's beautiful. You're born with this knowing. How did you know to grow your arms long and your, the hair and the, everything, everything that's grown, the, the whole thing that we, that we are babies and, and then we, we grow? That's not something that we can do. There's something that knows. There's intelligence behind all of life that knows how to grow us, that knows how to grow uh, a tree out of an acorn, that knows how to guide fish, um, to guide migration from uh, bird migrations. There's a deeper knowing beyond any knowledge that we can have. That same intelligence has grown you, has made you who you are today, and will continue to unfold in your life if you just let it. Actually, it will do so even if you don't let it. But we can get out of our own way. And that's something that I sure would have loved for somebody to tell me when I was young, that if I got out of my own way, it would be much easier. My path would not have been with that many bumps. It would just have been a life of more ease. So the way that that I, I share this now with, with young people is to show them how our mind, the thinking that we have, is a tool that is extremely practical. Oh my gosh, what will we do without our thinking? It's, it's a perfect tool for doing practical things. 
getting from here to there, uh, doing the work that I do, operating a computer, calling a friend that I want to see. It's, it's, it's incredible what a, what a gift it is. But the same gift that I have, my thinking gift that I have that I can do all these practical, wonderful things with and celebrate life with is also the same tool I can use to imagine all sorts of horrible things. Being sometimes with my with my niece, um, listening to how she imagines all sorts of things, both wonderful things like she'll marry a prince, like we all think at fourteen. Actually, these days it's probably more like a rock star or something. But but listening to all that's going on in her head about the future, both the the beautiful dreams that she can have, but also all the horror stories. Next year she's going away. Um, to boarding school for a year and she's frightened that, that she might lose some of her friends I can understand that that it's 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 so natural to to think that so this amazing tool that we could call thought we can use that to think anything the most wonderful dreams the most horrifying movies that we can make inside of our head with where people disown us or don't want to be friends with us or hate us or write horrible things about us on Facebook. I mean, all these imagined things. And what I try to point both my niece and, and other young people and adults to is the fact that whatever we believe to be true is, is what we'll feel that we live in the belief system that we have. And when we let go of our beliefs and simply are present in the here and now, there's enormous power of knowing. Now, life is gonna hit us. You know, there's gonna be um, divorces and get let off from work and friends who don't wanna be friends with us anymore. And there's gonna be all of these things that life is a contact spot, uh, as Sydney Banks would say sometimes. So we cannot escape the reality that we live in. But boy, can we change the way that we react to it. Now, by, by believing that everything that happens to me is happening uh, because somebody's against me or somebody hates me or, or something, feeling, uh, if, if I believe that I'm a... Um, a victim of life, I'm going to feel extremely insecure. Again, we're back to this, this ground of, 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 of something that's unstable. This happened. Oh, it's, it's being done to me. This friend doesn't want to see me. Oh my gosh, what does that mean about me? So all of these thinking about what it means helps me be unstable. <laughs> oh, it, it doesn't help. It's, 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 it's actually not very helpful at all. So pointing people to the knowing that's beyond anything you can think. There's a knowing inside that, that just knows it's just simple things. I know it's time to go up and get a glass of water, or I know that it's time to go to bed and sleep, or I just have the sense to call my friend or whatever it is. And to help people see that this knowing inside is beyond any thought seeing that thought is a really practical tool. I, 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 I'm so pleased to have this tool and to see the creativity that lies in, in everyone who, that we can celebrate life together. I love that we can do that. And I also notice that when I go into the future and start worrying about something, that I will feel the consequence of that worrying thinking immediately. As soon as the thought comes at the same time, on a biochemical level, the feeling arrives at the same time. Now, what's different for me now as an adult uh, is that now I know that I'm feeling my thinking. I'm not feeling reality because I have no idea what's going to happen in one minute, two minutes. A lightning might st strike down in my house any given moment and uh, then this webinar would be over. But there's a knowing inside that actually knows how to respond to any situation that arises in the moment. And when I am not stuck in my thinking about the future, I'm much more capable, I'm much more resourceful 
and able to respond to that, whatever it is that comes. So going into the future doesn't help me. Now, when I go into the future today, I mean, I, I worry about things um, often, but the difference is that as soon as I feel the sense of tightness and worry inside of me, I know that I'm moving in the wrong direction. And where before I would move even more into that direction and worry even more and try and solve it with my intellect, now I know to let go, to relax, and to let the intelligence behind all of life solve this for me. Big things, small things. There's an intelligence behind all of life that has created everything that knows how to solve my little tiny problem because anything that's a problem in my life is tiny compared to the universe. It just seems big to me. So that's one of the things that I, I help people see is that, that we have this beautiful, beautiful tool uh, of thought that's, that just can help us, guide us through life. And I also help people see that there's an intelligence behind all of life that guides us beautifully via wisdom by a love this whatever we love whatever we when young people come to me and say oh, i don't know what to do what, what 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 will i do with my life what should i become which direction should i go i always say what do you love what do you love to do i was i was speaking to my 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 dear friend linda pettit the other day and she was telling me about her grandson luke who likes to take things apart Right, he's so he, he's a, he's a little more than two years old, and he she's noticing already that he's takes something and he looks at it and he looks from every angle and tries to take it apart and find out how how it gets in. Now we don't know if he will become an engineer, but there is something about knowing what you love to do. For some people, it's oh, I love animals. I wanna I wanna be around animals. And they might become a biologist or work in a zoo or in a circus or, you know, they'll become a, a doctor, um, a vet. Other people, it's, I love being out in nature, like my husband. He knew from the age of 12 that he just loved being out in nature. So he, he left school after sixth grade. And he's, he loves to be outside. In fact, he got up at five this morning and he's just right now come inside the house he just loves being outside. He's been on the grass taking out um, weeds. He loves nature. So he's a gardener. So there's, there's, there's a connection between what we love and how we can express ourselves in life. So when I, when I um, share with people that, what do you love? What, what I share with them how to get in touch with what they love. And, and most people know what they love. The more we are in touch with the knowing, the more we let life guide us in the right direction. So there's this wisdom, there's this intelligence behind of life that guides us through love and wisdom, what we love to do. I remember the, the moment that I knew that I loved my husband. We were dating and I remember one day thinking, I was, we were just talking and I, I looked at him and the, the, I knew in that moment that I loved him. It had gone from, oh, he's so sweet. Oh, I love to be with him and it's fun. And, and then, oh my gosh, this, I love him. Like, I love him. <laughs> it wasn't just, this is fun. I, I love this man. And I actually want to live my life with him. I knew it. And in that moment, it was so interesting because he looked at me and I, I looked serious for a moment and he got frightened that I was about to split up with him. <laughs> So he was, he looked at me with these scared eyes and I was actually frightened to tell him that I loved him because it was a pretty big deal for me. Um, and I was frightened that, that for him, this was just fun and game so that, that he would be frightened and then he would leave me. But the, the more that I, that I said, oh, it's nothing, the more frightened he got. So in the end, I, I told him, I, I said, I, I just realized I really love you. And then he just tears ran down his his cheeks and he said, I love you too. And um, that's when we decided to get married. So it doesn't fit into an Excel sheet. 
the love that I feel. It's annoying. What I, what I do today, the work that I have sharing with uh, thousands of people around the world, one-to-one uh, -one in webinars, uh, through the book that I wrote with my dear friend, Dr. Dickin Bettinger called Coming Home, uh, through webinars, seminars, all of these different things that I do, speaking at conferences. Um, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. This is what I love. I would do this in any circumstance. If I was put into jail and, and unable to, to come out into the world the way that I do now, I would share with people every single day. I would, I would uh, talk to people around me. If they would allow me, I would do seminars. When you truly do what you love, when you truly follow your inner passion, there's nothing that can stop you. Because people resonate with people who do what they love. They feel it. They feel the, authentic the authenticity of what they're expressing, expressing through this love. So we've talked about two principles, uh, mainly the principle of, of, of thought, which is this wonderful creative tool we can use to either frighten ourselves to death or, or to just be really practical, which is wonderful. We've also talked about this principle of, 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 uh, of love and wisdom, this intelligence behind all of life that guides us always, always, it always does. And, and uh, there's this other principle as well, this principle of, of being aware, this principle of consciousness, this, this just knowing. Now, when we have experiences, which we do all the time, experiences come and go, the experience of being hungry or being angry or being sad or being let down, all of these experiences that come and go, ask yourself one, once in a while, well, who knows my experience? What is it that's knowing the experience that I'm having right now? There's an I that can say, I'm experiencing being let down, or I am experiencing sadness. I'm experiencing love. I'm experiencing joy. But what is the I who's knowing what the experience is? We're back to where I started saying that there's something, there's a grounding, there's something that we know. There's something deeper inside of us that guides us. There's, some, there's a knowing that's always present in the background of experience. So if you imagine that any experience that comes and goes, because that's the nature of experiences, if you imagine that they're kind of out in the foreground going on. Now, if I get confused between the experience and who's watching the experience or who's aware of the experience, when those two things come together, then I become the experience and I suffer the consequences. If it's a wonderful experience, wonderful, happy days. There's so many wonderful experiences that life brings us. When it's a, a horrible experience, the, the, the horrible experience of, of um, you know, a, a partner leaving you or getting laid off from the work or, you know, all these different things that we go through. So if, if, again, I believe that to be me, then I will suffer the consequences of that experience. But what if I could be aware of what it is in the background that is aware of the experience? What if my grounding was noticing the awareness behind all of experience? Letting the experience go on in the foreground because we can't stop experience. Experience is created from thought and thought happens all the time. But noticing that in the background of experience is an awareness of it. There's a knowing of it. Now I can ask anybody, how do you know how you feel? And to, to answer that question, they have to kind of go inside and say, well, how do I know? Well, I feel it in my body. How do you know that you feel it in your body? Well, I know it. Yeah. Now, the knowing that knows how you're feeling, for instance, in your body, is not affected by whatever is going on in your body. Let's say I have a, a sore knee. Right? My knee is hurting. Well, the knowing of the pain 
doesn't have any pain. The pain is different. The, the pain is the experience. There's a knowing of the experience that's not in pain. This is incredible news. This is the, the deepest thing that I've learned in my entire life, which is that the knowing of my experiences is unharmed by any experiences I've had in my entire life. Doesn't matter what experiences you've gone through. I speak to people who've been through lots of horrible experiences in their life, torture, rape, violence, bullying. But there's something that I know is completely untouched by whatever experience they've gone through, which is the knowing of it. Now, the knowing of it, the I, is who we really are. It's the truth of who we are. The knowing that's known all of your experiences throughout your entire life is untouched, unscratched, unharmed by any experience you've gone through. Seeing this, realizing this for yourself, understanding this at a deep level changes everything. Especially when you're a young person growing up, standing on this unstable ground of, of, of believing things to be true that are outside of themselves. Knowing that whatever happens in, in these tender years that are not really tender because we're resilient beyond belief, but it certainly feels tender at the time, but knowing that there's, there's something inside that will never break. Your heart can't break even though your boyfriend or girlfriend leaves you. It certainly feels that way. I know that. Nothing can be destroyed, even if you are, um, if somebody bullies you, if somebody um, hits you, any violence. Who you are is always untouched by whatever experience that you have. And sure, your body can get bruised. Sure, you can have scars on your body that you might have for life. But that's just your body. And you are not your body. You are aware of your body. The body comes and goes. The body changes. Isn't it great to know that you are not your body? Because you can't be something that comes and goes. It feels so real when we think and feel, but still it's not who we are because it comes and goes. We are that which is aware of what we're thinking and feeling and the sensations that our body has. We are aware of the awareness behind it. So I've tried to talk a little bit about these three guiding principles that is constant. They don't go away. There's no exceptions. Even though you might sit out there right now and think, no, I'm the exception, I'm certain of it. I can assure you, you're not. These are principles that guide all of us, that actually lives us. We are these principles in action. We are constantly being flooded by thought. Even when we fall asleep, we dream. It was so funny. I, I was um, dreaming this morning that a tarantula spider came into the house. And um, when I woke up, it was really nice to know that that, that was a dream. And then I was in the bathroom earlier to take a shower and I noticed something out of the corner of my eye and there was a tiny little spider, black spider there. And I started laughing because I, I was remembering my dream, which was, it was a lot bigger than tarantula. So it was nice to know that it was just a little spider that couldn't harm me. Now that's that, that experience of like, oh, whew, it wasn't real. That's what can happen to us every moment as we wake up to the fact that what we're thinking is not truth. That we have this, this principle that we can use creatively in, in, in all sorts of ways. But just to know that it's not true. It's, it's, it's creativity itself. Truth is something deeper than that. Truth is deeper than anything that our intellect can ever go to. So that was the one principle. The other principle was this principle of just being aware, which is really helpful when you're having a, a tough experience, even the experience of, of, of physical pain, 
just to notice what's aware of the pain. Now, it doesn't make the pain go away, but it certainly it reduces the psychological suffering that can be um, that can come with with physical pain, because the physical pain is enough. But to know that there's something inside that's not suffering that at all, which is the awareness of the pain. And finding this guiding principle of, of wisdom and love, this intelligence behind all of life, that will perfectly let you know what you're supposed to be doing in life. It's not even supposed to be doing. It's just what, what unfolds naturally in you, what you love, getting in touch with that. And you might not know at 14 what you want to do. Not a lot of people do. Maybe you won't even know at 19. Maybe you won't know at 25. But one day you will. And when you do, that's going to that's will guide you towards the right people, the right circumstances to to let you unfold all which you are. So that's uh, three things that I would have loved to have known when I was a lot younger, that there was something that just always guided me perfectly. Looking back, I'm 48 now. Looking back now, it's I can see these guiding principles. I can see they've always been there. But my gosh, uh, when I was 14, I didn't know this, and that would have been helpful. So I hope that that was some helpful um, for, for, for you to, um, to hear about. And I wanted to check in if there was any questions, anything you wanted to ask me. Okay, so there are no hands up or questions in the chat box just yet, but I, there are several things that came to me from my experience of being at that age too. So I'm just wondering, when you said you may not know at 14 or even at 20 what you want to do, so what do you do? Mm. Well, there is something that you do know. So for instance, I knew that I liked people and I knew that um, I thought, well, well, what would be something where I could be in touch with other people? How could I be? So the, I had two things that I knew that I loved people and being of service. That was something that I knew deep inside. So I started to become a nurse. Hmm. I never worked a day in my life as a nurse because there came a, a point in time where I just knew that this was not the path for me. So about a year and a half into nurse, nursing school, I was like, hmm, I'm actually more interested in the mind and how the mind works. And then I shifted. Then I shifted and became a psychotherapist, starting study, started to study that. So what I knew was people being of service. Those have been my guiding lights. Now, they have taken many forms. Even when I was a student in school, I, I was working, um, actually, in, um, I was selling sweets in a sweet store. I loved being there. I loved sweets, too. But I loved being of service, and I loved um, just being around people. So I can see that these two principles have been there always, always. Teaching table tennis, um, becoming a Tai Chi instructor. So there was so even though the the actual job was not the job that I that I have now, I can see how the guiding principles of love of people and of of sharing, uh, and being of service has always guided me. I see the same principle in my sister. She's a physiotherapist. She has loved old people since she was I don't know five. It was so interesting. We would go to the park as children and she would, um, we would sit speaking with my grandmother and my sister would um, take the feet of these old women and she would massage them at five, six, seven years old. And what does she do today? She's a physiotherapist in a geriatric center. It's all she's done her entire life is being of service to, to old people. Nothing in the world can convince her to do anything else, even though she's been offered jobs at uh, fancy sports clinics where she could make three times what she's making now. Uh, she loves being of service to old people through the art of physiotherapy. So I believe that, that we can all know that about ourselves and maybe we need a little help to guide us into that, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we have that in some capacity. Yes, and what I'm, what I'm really interested in what you've just said is though that you can't get it wrong, that 
that you did you did whatever came to you at the time and then you noticed oh well actually I have a I I have an urge to do something different it's not that we can get it wrong and we can't change I'm I'm thinking about that because because when you were talking about how you would have liked to have known this when you were at school and and I was thinking oh it would have been so lovely if someone had asked me what do you love to do what do you really love because I I had in mind what I should do and I must I should be doing this and I should be saving the world and I should be becoming a doctor and I should and it the funny thing is that I'm like your husband. I love to be outdoors. And there's not much being outdoors when you're a doctor. <laughs> but again, I still know now that I was being guided all the way. And there were so many things that I learned and so many things that I've learned that, that still help me now in doing that, that it's all guidance. The the biggest thing that I noticed when I first learned about the principles you've been talking about and understood that was that I had always, like you, known that there was something else that was a bigger, um, a bigger power behind life. And I used to ask for guidance. I all the time used to ask for guidance and couldn't understand why I still kept getting into uh, the wrong marriages and the wrong jobs and the and, and feeling unhappy and it was only when I understood how the principles work that I understood that I had been misunderstanding guidance I had been taking uncomfortable feelings as guidance instead of the the that deep knowing feeling that you've been talking about hmm and it's been lovely being in that feeling, listening to you. It's just, which is much more the point, isn't it? It's learning to, well, not even learning to, but just experiencing the feeling. And then what I've noticed is that things start to happen automatically. So like you were talking about the pain, a couple of years ago, I broke my shoulder skiing. And it hurt a lot but nobody could understand why I wasn't suffering. It was just so funny. It was really funny. And I, it didn't occur to me. I wasn't thinking about it. It just didn't even occur to me that I, it was broken. You know, it was that, it was hurt a lot, but because it didn't enter my head that it was broken and I wasn't having lots of thinking about that, I was just, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. So... So it's an experience, isn't it? Really, it is. And, uh, and there's two things that you said that I that I am um, that I absolutely agree with. One thing is just to know you can't get it wrong. Oh my gosh, I remember you know taking a job. Like, what if it's the wrong job? What if I'm studying this and it's the wrong? Like, I started studying um, to be a nurse. Well, after a year and a half, I stopped. Do I regret that year and a half? Oh no, oh my gosh. I learned so much about myself, about the human body. It's been helpful thousands of times in my life, just the year and a half that I did. And also it led me to the next step. If I had not done that, I wouldn't have arrived to the conclusion, oh, it's actually, I love be uh, human beings, but it's actually much more what goes on in here than what goes on in, in the body. So, and also to know that, you know, entering into a new relationship, will this work? It'll work as long as it does until it doesn't, or, or it'll work the rest of the life, your life. But whatever, whatever, it, whatever you go through of experiences with this partner is going to lead you to the next step. Now, I believe truly that I would not, not have left, um, met my husband if I hadn't, you know, kissed the other frogs along the way that every single relationship I've been in has taught me something about myself, about life. And that at the time that I met him, I was ready. And that the time that he met me, he was ready for what we now have and what's unfolding between us. 
Now, his marriage to, to, to his ex-wife was not wrong. It was perfect. The relationships I've had with, with partners were not wrong. They were perfect to bring me to exactly this place. But it sure would have been nice to have known before in time. Now, I'm Danish, uh, and uh, we have a, um, a Danish philosopher. Well, he's dead now, but his, his name um, is Søren Kierkegaard. And he, uh, he, he always used to say that you live your life forward, but you understand it backwards. I think most of us have, the, the, uh, have had the experience of look where we say, well, looking back now, it was actually a good idea. Or looking back now, that wasn't such a good idea, but boy, did I learn something from it. But I can see how powerful it is to have known, if I'd known some of these things at the time, just to know that I can't get it wrong. That, that was one of the things that I heard you say. And the other thing that I, that I heard you say, Anne, was this thing about the feeling, letting the feeling of love guide you. Now, love is not the same as excitement, because I can sure get excited about a lot of things. Like I can get excited about a brand new pair of shoes. Ooh, they are beautiful. I want them. <laughs> there, there's an excitement that, that, that is not to be, um, it's not the same as, as a deep feeling of love. And what love is, is knowing. Love is deeper than, than the, the excitement about something in the moment. And I knew at an early age that I loved people. I really did. It was, it was obvious to me. I loved interactions. I loved being in groups. I loved sharing whatever I knew. I loved reading a book and, and telling somebody about it, seeing a movie and telling something about it. Later on in life, I loved making a meal and sharing it with my friends. We just had a uh, wonderful friends, Linda and Bill Pettit in Denmark for a week, and we loved showing them around our beautiful country. So there's this, this sense of being with friends, making food, uh, loving sharing. That's always been, that's, that's just, it's who I am. It's, it's what, it's how, it's the way that the intelligence behind of life expresses through me. For other people, like my, my wonderful friend Kari from Norway, who painted this beautiful painting beside me, her love expresses through art. Right? So, so it's, it's different, but my gosh, do, do I love her paintings because I see the love that she has for the art expresses out into these beautiful paintings that um, bring people joy in their homes when they own them. And for another person, it might be music or another person, it might be a uh, accountant or a gardener or a baker. I have a good friend who, who makes cakes. She's one of the best in the country. She makes cakes for our queen in, in, in our country. She's amazing. She loves cakes, right? So whatever you love, if you make what you love become what you do, you're going to have a happy life. If you let what you think you ought to be doing guide you, you're probably not going to be as happy. I hear young people saying, oh, I just want a job where I can make a lot of money. What, what, what do I have to do to make a lot of money? Because they believe that money is what makes them happy. Well, take your backpack and go to a third world country and, and see the people who have nothing and see them dancing in the streets and see them sharing their last little piece of rice with you. And then you start knowing that joy, happiness, does not come from anything from the outside world. And it's so interesting because people know this intuitively. We all know really wealthy people who are miserable. I also know wealthy people who are very happy. <laughs> so it's not about that. But we also know people who have nothing and who are dancing in the street. And we know people who are uh, poor and, and, and miserable. It has nothing to do with wealth. So choosing your line of work from, from uh, what you believe will make you money is not going to make you happy. I promise you, if you choose from what you love, then whatever you do, is, is, is going, you're going to be in direct contact with the joy within that's always there. Yes, that's, 
That's true because doing this, I'm just loving every minute of this and it's taking up every hour of the day. I mean, as soon as I get up in the morning, I can't start waiting to do it. And, and in the evenings before I go to bed, I can't, I'll, I'll go to sleep sometime, you know. So I just love doing it. But the other thing that came to my mind was there may be a question. We all do things in our lives that we're not proud of, that we feel bad about, that we're not. And how does this apply? How do these principles apply in those sorts of situations? How do we look at those when we've done something? And say, for example, somebody has hurt somebody really badly or they feel bad about themselves. How, how does this apply in situations like that? The thing, the, the thing that I find is 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 really important in, in that situation is to start seeing that where you were in the moment. Now, when I say where you were, I don't mean in the physical place, but where you were in your emotional body, in your in your believing of the world. That exact moment was a time that you were not in your fullest. When people are full of love and compassion and joy. We don't hurt other people. Nobody does. Go across the world, see a person who's happy and joyful, they won't hurt a fly. So when we do hurt people through our actions, through our words, through um, hitting or only doing something physical, even murdering somebody, it is because in the moment that we were doing that, there was belief about what was true that, that led us to believe that what we were doing was right. Even the person in um, Las Vegas who was shooting out a window, uh, you know, shooting all, all these people or people who go into schools in America and, and, and do shootings. In the moment that they're doing it, they believe that that is true, that, that whatever they're doing makes sense to them in that moment. Now, those are extreme um, situations, but even for, for ourselves, to have compassion with and to see clearly, well, in that moment when I said that horrible thing to my friend, I was in a bad place. When people, people are in a bad place all over the world or through you know, all kinds of people, rich, poor, old, young, when we're in a bad place, our actions, the way we respond to people, our communication is often very negative. That's how it works. The system works in a way that, 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 that we have a tendency to when we're, like if, if it was like this, if we're, if we're, if, when we're down, the communication from down here is usually not very nice. When I'm up, when I'm loving, when I'm caring, when I'm happy, communication is great. I don't need a communication tool when I'm here. And when I'm here, no communication tool in the world is going to help me. So having compassion with yourself that, oh, I see that in that moment when I said that thing to my friend, I was, not, I was not really myself. I was believing something to be true that I see now wasn't true. Or if it's something that's happened to you, somebody did something to you, just really seeing the separate reality of the fact that the other person was believing what they felt to be true. Now, it doesn't excuse the behavior. People do horrible things to each other and, and the behavior is just terrible. But even people who I work with who have been, where well, people have done terrible, terrible things to them, they can learn to see that the innocence of the person's reality in the moment that looks so real to them. They can see the innocence of not knowing any better in the moment. Still doesn't excuse the behavior, but it helps with the forgiveness process. And forgiveness inside of ourselves is, is when I'm not yet when I'm not carrying the burden of hating somebody anymore. It's such freedom. My my good friend uh, Dick and Bettinger says sometimes that you know when when you want to revenge something or you're, you're angry at somebody, it's like drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. Right, or get sick, but actually we're the ones suffering. So seeing the innocence in ourselves, seeing the innocence in the other person, having compassion with the other person, with the state of mind they were in in the moment, with the state of mind I was in at the moment. So when I look back in my life through the things that I've done that 
that I regretted at the time. When I look at it now, I see, oh, I was innocently not knowing what I was doing. I was innocently believing the false grounding that I thought to be true. And I don't do that anymore. Now when I get angry with somebody, which, which happens rarely, but it does sometimes, I know not to do anything. I wait until my state of mind changes. When my state of mind changes and I, I, I come up again, that's the time to look at it with fresh eyes and goes, what, what happened there? Was it so terrible? What might have happened in the other person? And it becomes easier to let go. And that's the power of knowing. Knowing when to engage, knowing when not to engage. Knowing who I am, knowing who everybody is. Knowing that nothing can be broken, nothing can be scratched, nothing can be torn apart. That's the power of knowing that I wanted to share with you today. Yes, that's really beautiful. Thank you. So we still don't have any questions. Anyone want to make any comments or any questions? I think they're all just in that lovely feeling. Well, so I think, yeah. I was going to say, it's just been lovely being here. And it it yeah. certainly has. It's been absolutely wonderful. So I think we'll just end it there for now and let people just enjoy that feeling. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.